major uh, mental health diagnoses that either per, either survivors either present as having or may indeed have are issues of post-traumatic stress, the manic depressive disorders, depression, anxiety, issues of addiction, dissociative disorders, eating disorders, and compulsive obsessive disorders. So I'd like to just read to you this slide on active listening. You can read along with me. But active listening is the act of mindfully hearing and attempting to comprehend the meaning of words spoken by another in a conversation. It is listening and communicating that you are listening by making sounds, gestures that indicate attentiveness, as well as the listener giving feedback in the form of a paraphrase or rendition of what has been said. In our line of work, it also means listening with our heart, being with a felt sense of what's being communicated and listening for what's not being voiced. And whenever possible, also listening for the nonverbals, the body language. And it's particularly important when we speak to survivors because it can be really challenging at times to, to speak what's on your mind, to speak what is fearful, to speak what is shameful. And so we are listening and um, sometimes even reflecting back questions that we think the survivor may be asking. Um, and we, we check in with, is this what you mean or is this something you're thinking about or is this something you want to ask? to communicate that we are indeed actively speaking. So the things that are important to, uh, to actively listen is to remember that as an active listener, we do not lecture, uh, we share information. And certainly when working with survivors of trauma and sexual abuse, where so much of the impact of the abuse is being overpowered, it is really important to do much more listening than speaking and certainly to wait for the survivor to ask questions and respond to those. To be accepting and caring, to be objective. Remember that we're there to support and serve the survivor, to remind the survivor that we do care about them and to be clear about the questions that um, they're asking, that you're asking of them. Um, it is important, as I said a moment ago, to access the mood, the tone, what may be going on for them that they're unable to speak about. To get clear about what coping skills a survivor may have had from beyond or before the assault, but also how they cope in general, how they have been coping with the events that has taken place or how they cope in general with challenging situations in their life, to discuss alternatives, to remember to ask open-ended questions, to focus on the present. Very important uh, listening skill, and that is to focus on the present. What is the purpose of the call in the moment? Um, and for some survivors, it's even challenging to, to figure out why they're calling, particularly those who are having triggers or are just feeling bad and they're just calling because they need to feel connected and not quite sure what the direction of the call needs to be, that's an opportunity for us to actively engage them in how can I assist you, what is going on for you, what may you need support with. Um, to remember to not make promises on your calls. Um, you can only do as much as you can within the period of time that the survivors are on the call by giving information, by offering support, by helping to explore alternatives, um, and noting that the survivor may need to call many, many more times in order to get an end result or the end result that they're expecting, which sometimes is indeed to feel better. And uh, finally, to know yourself, to know what uh, what your beliefs are, what your assumptions are, what your prejudice may be, so that you are um, not in any way um, projecting those and affecting the caller or affecting the call in a negative way. Or perhaps not even able to hear what's being said uh, because of your own biases. 
So this brings me to the barriers to active listening, of course. I just mentioned our own judgments and the conclusions that we make about who's calling, about what happened, about what they may be feeling or and or experiencing, and even about the decisions that they may want to make. So we try not to make assumptions um, and to not jump to conclusions. We also are very aware of what I like calling or labeling when the survivor hits home, when the survivor is talking about information that may be triggering for us or information that we may assume and or um, interpret as being judgmental, remembering that on the call we are there to support and to assist. Certainly we set boundaries around not uh, being abused on a call and not um, allowing survivors to think it's okay to be inappropriate and things of that nature, and we'll get to that in a moment in terms of speaking to difficult callers. But when you yourself have been treated, it's extremely important to be aware of that as it creates barriers to them staying open to the call. Um, your own attention span, so remembering to take care of yourself so that you can be ready for the call, um, have your needs met. Um, semantics, again, doing less talking and more listening, and whatever fears or concerns you may have about the information that's being shared or about your ability to respond to that particular call are things that can be barriers. It's okay to allow for silence. It's okay to provide some simple acknowledgments as the definition of active listening states by using sounds in your voice that indicate that you're with the caller despite the fact that there's silence so that there aren't words, to use door openers, to provide mirroring of feedback so to reflect back, that paraphrase what you've heard it also requires you sometimes to summarize what you have heard. And I particularly like being able to summarize towards the end of a call as well to kind of recap what has been discussed, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, using keywords and phrases, and using keywords and phrases for me mean using the language of the survivor. In our field, we have a lot of... Uh, very specific language that we use to speak about the issues of sexual violence. A survivor may or may not be comfortable with those phrases. A survivor may feel that you're being impersonal. So listen for the phrases that the survivor uses and try to use those phrases, um, even down to how they refer to the rape or the assault or the incident or the event or what happened. Uh, using, again, their language. Remember that um, it is our responsibility to provide education, not necessarily to assume that that which we suggest is, is going to be taken and, and applied, but to just provide as much information and education as possible so that the survivor gets to empower themselves in making the best decisions for themselves. And then also to remember to stay in the present, to respond to the experiences that are being presented in the moment by the survivor. So I would like to uh, take a moment here and just ask that you unmute your phones. And if you have any questions before we begin and move into uh, discussing specific difficult callers, this would be a good opportunity to either uh, chat on them or simply uh, speak your question. To remind everybody, this is a chair person, you can unmute your line by hitting star seven. And so I am going to assume that um, we're all on and so far that the information that has been presented 
has been very much of an overview and continue. So discussing the difficult callers, um, I have listed a few of the, of the most common difficult callers, your silent caller, the caller who calls and um, doesn't respond to the phone. And of course, often we assume that those are just crank callers or people who are calling just to be annoying um, or who knows what else we decide is going on. And it's important that sometimes you may get a silent caller who indeed is a survivor and is just having a hard time after making the call in speaking up. Um, they dial the number, they hear you respond that it's a hotline for sexual assault, and they freeze. They don't know what to say. They don't know how to begin to, to discuss what's going on for them. They're unable to express their feelings, their needs, their thoughts. They may be fearing that um, you may reject them or judge them or not understand. They're unable to trust the person on the other end. And so there's some phrases here, some things that you can say while the line is quiet. Sometimes um, it helps to encourage the caller to speak. So some of the things that you may be able to say uh, may be sometimes it is hard to begin talking about things that trouble us. You may say, I want to help. Um, you can trust me. Your call is anonymous. I'm here to listen. Uh, you can begin to talk whenever you're ready. Um, you can even let them know that you will hold the line for a little bit, um, something like, I'd like to listen, but I'll need to end the call soon if we do not talk. However, that we do have time. Let them know that they can call back at any moment that they need to, that there will be someone there to answer their call. Um, and also acknowledging the the piece that I mentioned initially that it is hard sometimes to speak to a stranger, to call and admit that something has happened, such as an assault, to um, not know whether or not you're going to be well relieved, and that it's okay if they call and they need to be silent. Um, and once again, encouraging them to feel free to call again if they need to at any time. The angry callers are callers that also can be really challenging to speak uh, to because they're angry, and they're angry at just about anyone. Uh, they're angry at the abuser. They're angry at their friends. They're angry at their situation. They're angry at themselves. And sometimes they are unable to, to realize that you're there to support them. And so they may call and um, have expectations that are unrealistic of the call, or they may call and just really need to or want to just vent and they're using, you know, a voice that, that feels inappropriate. And so it's, it's important for us to remember that and to remember that and to also know that it is important for them to be angry. And so we make room for them to be angry, again, provided that, uh, that we are not being personally attacked. Um, we do our best to recognize that they have a reason to be angry. And some of the things that you may want to say is, yeah, it sounds like you're very angry and you have a right to be angry. It's frustrating to not be able to get the things that you need or want. Remembering that for some survivors, um, not all the time, but often they've had a challenge finding the support that they need. Um, her life has become much more difficult, and they're on their own kind of trying to figure it out. So you want to reassure them that it's okay to be angry. Um, you want to ask them how have they dealt with situations that are challenging or that, that have solicited anger in the past. What seems to help them? Um, you want to let them know that... Um, it is much easier for you to support them if you can hear them, if they can calm down, um, that you understand that they're angry, but if you're going to be able to serve them to assist them to support them, you need to be able to hear what they're saying. 
Um, and if you find that the the rage or anger continues, then at some point you may also need to be able to say that, although you really want to help, um, at the moment is the yelling is not able to, to be controlled or to stop, that you're going to suggest that they call back at a time when you're feeling better um, and that you do hope that they call back. So, again, it's keeping that balance between, yes, we understand that you're angry. You have a reason to be angry. However, um, I can't help you if you continue to, uh, to scream and if I cannot understand what your needs are. Secondary survivors can also be extremely challenging. Uh, secondary survivors are the friends, family, partners of survivors who are calling to seek information, to seek support, or sometimes they're calling because they want someone to help their loved one. Their loved one may not be ready to either admit that they've been assaulted or does not uh, feel that they need the support or is not motivated enough because of depression or other emotional distress to actually make that call, and you will find secondary survivors calling on their behalf. Uh, secondary survivors may also be other professionals calling for information and resources for a client. Um, and those can be challenging calls. Sometimes they, too, are experiencing distress because they don't know how to help or they don't know what to do to support their loved one, or they may be judging or questioning uh, how this is possible to have happened, how their loved one got assaulted, um, or why, um, especially if you've got uh, someone who's calling who has a loved one who has been assaulted before, there can be a lot of judgment and prejudice around that. Um, and they may also, that is, the family member or friend may be calling with a sense of uh, need for revenge, a sense of guilt because they weren't able to support or stop. You find that to be true often uh, with spouses or partners of those who get assaulted, the desire to want to do something about about it, their uh, loss of control for not being able to keep their loved ones safe. And so in, in those kind of calls with secondary survivors, you want to validate their experience as a secondary survivor, depending on the relationship that they've had with the survivor, they too have experienced some form of trauma, loss of control. Their life, too, will be affected by the fact that their loved one um, is, is now challenged with the traumatic experience, the aftermath. So you want to assist them in owning what is your own feelings and uh, reminding them and educating them about how important it is for them to allow the survivor to have their own experience to have their own story, to tell their story, uh, reminding them that the survivor's story is the survivor's story to tell in their own way, and that you are there to support them as well. You want to educate them as much as possible about what they should expect uh, from the survivor in terms of the emotional distress that they will be going to, the stages of assault and rape, you may want to remind them about the rape trauma syndrome or teach them about the rape trauma syndrome so that they have some sense of control and understanding and ultimately that they can better be able to support the survivor. That is the ultimate, um, our ultimate goal as advocates is to support them so they can support the survivors. So you want to provide them with support and education. Um, so that they can continue to be there to support and encourage them as well to continue to use the hotline as a source of support. We have the difficult caller that may call intoxicated under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And in those particular cases, we want to most of all put in check our judgments understanding and recognizing that substance abuse and use 
our coping mechanisms. And that's for some survivors, again, if they've had any form of uh, mental illness, any form of previous trauma, any form of addiction that had been arrested, a traumatic event can trigger those maladaptive behaviors as ways of coping. And so we remember that and we understand that. We're not on the hotline to judge or question whether or not, whether or not someone is using. And so it is really important to know that as long as the survivor is able to go through with the call, present what their need is, hear the suggestions, have a dialogue about what is going on for them and what they need support with, the fact that they may have been consuming substances is not a reason for us to judge or disconnect the call. However, if the survivor appears to be intoxicated to the extent that we cannot um, follow through with the phone call, then it is important for us to assess that and to encourage the survivor to call back. So assessing the likelihood of intoxication requires extreme listening skills in that you want to listen for incoherency and inability to cognitively understand what's going on in the call, the rambling, the fading in and out, the falling asleep, the giggling, the slurring of speech. We want to also be mindful that some of those same behaviors that we may um, determine to be indicators of someone who's intoxicated um, or under the influence of substances can be developmentally, um, can, be, can be signed of someone who is developmentally uh, disabled or someone who has cognitive impairment or someone who has some kind of stress or some kind of illness. So you want to be very, very sensitive in your assessment. Um, however, if after making that assessment, either the caller themselves has admitted because you have asked, have you been drinking? Are you the, under the influence of, of substances at this moment? Stating, I am having a hard time uh, listening, understanding, following. Um, is there a concern, something I need to be aware of as we continue with the call? Those are all kinds of questions that may help you to assess. And if you've assessed that indeed this caller is intoxicated, then you ask the caller if they would be able to to call back at another moment. You ask the caller if they are able to maybe um, once again call at another moment or if they're able to really understand what you're what you're sharing with them. Uh, you don't want to judge, you don't want to blame. You may even want to, to educate about how you understand the um, the use of substance and that in order for you to be helpful, um, you may need to terminate the call and you'd be more than glad to speak to them at another time or something to that effect. Um, again, recognizing that the call is limited if they're under, um, under the influence and encouraging them to call back. I think this may be a good time before we move into the obscene and prank callers once again for you all to open your lines and tell me or, or share if there are any questions or thoughts um, about the difficult callers that I have uh, described thus far. You may need to unmute your phone. As a reminder to unmute your phone, you can hit star seven. Okay, so then I will continue with uh, difficult callers in the way of obscene and crank callers. These are the individuals who are indeed calling um, and misusing 
the hotline. Um, again, like with your um, callers who may be intoxicated and or under the influence of drugs or alcohol, you want to be very, very careful and use all of your active listening skills to assess, to assess whether or not indeed you have a crank caller on the line. Um, and as soon as you're able to assess that, then you can simply and clearly, um, unapologetic about it, state that this is an inappropriate use of the hotline and that you will need to hang up and go ahead and do so immediately. Of course, we want to make sure that you have indeed done your due diligence in assessing um, that this is an obscene call. Uh, you will find that throughout time, and this is at least has been my experience, that crank callers uh, become familiar to, to the hotline and that they call often. And so you begin to recognize either their voice or their story. Um, so being mindful about that and whenever possible sharing information about crime callers among your, your coworkers and other people who respond, volunteers, other people who respond to the hotline so that everyone can have as much information as possible about those crank callers. Uh, but the things that are usually common about uh, these difficult callers is that their stories don't make sense. The story is inconsistent. They may start with one piece of a, a, of a story or relating a particular incident, but there are pieces that do not make sense or questions that you may ask. Um, that they are unable to respond to. Again, that is not always an indicator that you're a crime caller because we know that um, survivors of sexual violence that have been indeed traumatized and may have challenging time remembering all the aspects of your stories. But these are pieces of the story that just don't make sense to you. Uh, they begin wanting to use very graphic physical details of the story. And so one of the things that's important and we need to be mindful of doing this across the board, since we don't always know, is that there's no need to share graphic details, sexual details um, about the actual incident in order to get support. And so when you find that someone is super eager to share graphic details, you may want to redirect them. You may want to... Um, encourage them to speak about their feelings um, as a result of what happened to them more than the details of what happened. Um, and actually what, what I have found and, and what I've heard a lot of survivors, um, not survivors, I'm sorry, um, advocates speak about is that survivors often don't want to talk about the exact details, sexual body um, details of what the sexual assault was like. So I always find that to be a red flag when there's someone who is extremely um, eager to share details. Um, distractions. There may be all kinds of distractions. You find yourself asking the same question or sharing the same information, and it's clear that they have not heard the heavy breathing um, and, of course, the groans and sounds that leads you to believe that this person is getting aroused, um, their tone of voice. Those are all indicators that you may be dealing with a crank caller. Um, and once again, listening for the content of the story can be really helpful. I like telling the story of a crank caller, repeat caller, that would call often the hotline with a story about having been abused as a child um, now calling as an adult, but having been abused as a child, and before you knew it, he'd be into a story about how um, he now spent time with his mother and had intimate times with the mother who was a perpetrator and, and, and wanted to get into the story about how he was in love. And again, there was this way in which he would always start the story by initiating first the the 
kind of, I am a survivor, and this is what my story is. I was sexually abused by my mother as a child, and um, and then introducing the mom, and then uh, beginning to introduce how he was being sexually active now with his mom, and uh, maybe bringing in a sibling into the scene, and you could see how it could quickly escalate. So the moment we knew of the moment we heard that we were speaking to a male survivor who'd been sexually abused by his mother, lives with his mother, we knew to limit any other part of that story and begin to encourage him to speak about his feelings. And so um, very important, again, to assess, but to know that you can terminate the call. Um, other calls that can be challenging are those callers who have their own sense of what I call the isms, their prejudice, their sexism, racism, uh, their homophobia, um, and that they call certainly as survivors, but even as survivors, they call uh, being very inappropriate and not being sensitive to other cultures or races or sexual orientation and other oppressed groups. Um, and these can be really challenging, especially if you're speaking about yourself. This is one of those times when things can hit home. Um, and nonetheless, it is our, our role, our ethical responsibility to serve all survivors, even those who may um, have judgment and prejudice. So in those kind of situations, you want to be very uh, clear and set the boundary about how important it is to not be judgmental uh, during the calls and how you will need to remind them that uh, that those are boundaries of the hotline, um, that it's not appropriate to, to use language that is um, abusive and offensive to others. You may want to clarify the purpose of the hotline. This is not um, an opportunity to call and speak about all women who are sluts or all gay men who get raped or all black people who are rapists or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and so you want to allow them to know that they have a right to their own opinion and redirect them to how you can serve them and what information you can provide them. This is not a time to necessarily re-educate or get them to um, become aligned with what's appropriate or what we think or you think is appropriate. It's not a time to argue, but simply to redirect that this is a hotline for survivors of sexual violence and if they are identifying as a survivor, then how can you support them along those lines? Um, and again, like with all other difficult callers, that it is not okay uh, for you to be abused on the call and that uh, you will terminate the call if it's necessary and to know that it's okay to do that. Um, to make sure that you are indeed uh, taking care of yourself. Repeat callers, frequent callers, are folks who call repeatedly, compulsively. Um, these are your individuals who may or may not necessarily be in crisis, um, and this brings me to wanting to stress um, something that may be obvious, but it's a good time for me to mention that hotline survivors call with all kinds of concerns. So a crisis call is not only the call of an individual who's just gotten assaulted. Um, a crisis hotline is there to support an individual who is experiencing what to them is a crisis, so that you will get folks who are calling just having all kinds of challenges, challenges dealing with their day-to-day -day life, challenges dealing with their, perhaps their hygiene, perhaps with temptations around their children, negotiating their work environment, um, negotiating relationships, intimate relationships, nightmares, um, having flashbacks, uh, having triggers of all kinds. So it's important to remember that, 
that we don't need to necessarily be speaking about the assault or getting support about, so what do I do now in regards to the assault, um, to be actually supporting someone in crisis. So all of those different circumstances that I mentioned are appropriate hotline calls. However, sometimes you have the callers who have a need um, to connect with someone. They're not necessarily in distress. Other than that, they may not have anyone else to talk to. They may be lonely. They may be isolated because that sometimes is what comes with being traumatized and an ability to reach out. So you'll find folks who call compulsively. I mentioned much earlier also that trauma of sexual abuse can lead to compulsive obsessive behaviors of different sorts of different kinds. And so you will have sometimes repeat callers. These are opportunities for us to again, share among ourselves, advocates, and, and those responding to the hotline, the frequency with which you're getting the same type of call or the same person if you're able to identify the person. So you want to begin by assessing whether or not this is indeed the same caller. So assessing this distinct caller, uh, these are times when we are left with maybe coming up with a plan, establishing how many times a day uh, should this person call be received, and explaining that to the caller, explaining that the line needs to be open for other survivors and that it is extremely important for them to limit their phone calls. Some survivors can limit their compulsions, and some just cannot. And so we can be really helpful to them by setting a, a plan and having some boundaries around um, their calls. You may want to encourage them to call another number other than the hotline number. Perhaps there's someone at the office that they can call. These are your folks that you may want to really speak to them about coming in for counseling or calling a counseling line versus the crisis hotline um, so that developing a protocol for the frequency of their call and the purpose of the call can be really helpful. Um, understanding that it requires a lot of patience um, with individuals who uh, appear to us to not be in crisis and to be uh, calling uh, repeatedly. Sometimes your repeat callers are also callers that may be struggling with some kind of mental health issue. Um, so. Once again, listening for how best to direct your call, setting limits around the frequency of the call and the purpose of the call. Um, I am going to spend some time talking about uh, how to set up an intervention, a crisis intervention call. So with repeat callers, um, it is extremely important to stick to that plan um, so that the calls become more structured um, and better able to address their needs. So a crisis intervention call. It is quite easy sometimes when we're on the hotline to lose track of the fact that we are responding to a crisis hotline and that um, because it's a crisis hotline, there is a, there's a very distinct purpose to the call. Now, some of you may be responding to counseling uh, hotlines. If indeed you're responding to a counseling hotline, you can still use this format and you extend the time. Um, however, if we are responding to a 24-hour hotline, then it is important to have a general sense of what are the parameters of the call. For example, most hotline calls should not exceed more than 30 minutes. So understanding that you are pacing this call to address the needs of the survivor within those 30 minutes, letting the caller know at some point um, that there is a limit to the call. So 
um, that they've reached a crisis hotline, you introduce yourself, and you ask them how you can assist them. You let them know that you have a limited amount of time and you would like to be able to assist them during this time. Um, you may want to begin uh, soon after they've shared with you a little bit of what's going on for them or whatever initial small talk they may need to do or whatever encouraging you may need to do to get them to begin to speak to define what their concern is. What is the problem? What is their concern? Um, and soon after that, to ensure that the client is safe. So the first few uh, questions or uh, statements of the conversation need to be about what is happening to the survivor in the moment. Did they just get assaulted? Do they need you to support them with some police support, information about how to get to a hospital, um, what is what is needed in terms of creating a safety plan. If you find that your survivor is in crisis, then you forget everything else. Your plan is to make, not in crisis, I'm sorry, I meant to say, if you're you're finding that the caller is endangered, then the first order and only order of business is to get them to safety, to talk to them about how to get to a place where they are safe. If that's not an issue and the survivor is safe, um, having emotional distress or a crisis around the emotional psychological distress, then the next thing is, of course, to provide them with support. Support can come in the form of educating them about what they may be experiencing. Remember to be an active listener, to listen for what is happening for them, what they're requesting, what they need, what you can provide um, as far as information, education. Um, good time to be really mindful of the rape trauma syndrome as well as the post-traumatic stress symptoms and understanding that uh, you're there to support and educate the survivor about what they may be experiencing. I like being very clear that I am only the expert on general information about what they may be experiencing, but you want to encourage them to ask their specific questions about their situation and to share their specific distress. Help them to examine what, what options and alternatives they may have in regards to addressing their specific needs, whether it is exploring ways of calming themselves down, whether it is exploring whether or not they want to pursue um, legally, whether it is um, how to come out and or break their silence with a loved one, whatever it is you want to be there to educate and explore alternatives and help them to explore their alternatives. Somewhere after perhaps the first 15 minutes of your call, you should be creating an action plan. From the discussions that you have now had, what uh, will the survivor do? What does the survivor want to do? Um, what action will the survivor take? The action can be as simple as I am going to have a warm cup of tea and just go to bed. I will call again if I need to. Or it can be a lot more sophisticated and concrete. So when we say let's create an action plan, that too is led by and, um, and decided upon by the survivor. We as the advocate are just there to support. But you want to reiterate, right, that um, that we've talked now for however long it is, what will you do? Um, you also want to, once you have summarized, recapped, reiterated that action plan, have the survivor in some ways commit to what it is that they feel they want to do. It helps to... Uh, bring the call to to closure to say things like, so we've been on the phone for a little while now, um, we've developed your plan, and will you commit to doing that? Will you commit to, to doing as you said you would? Um, you want to thank them for calling the hotline or in some way find a way to 
acknowledge that what they've done is, it may be challenging, that it is a good thing that they've reached out to the hotline. Um, I have found that some some advocates may feel a little off about saying thank you for calling, as though it makes the call quite trivial. But you'll find your own way of acknowledging that they've done the right thing by reaching out for support and that the hotline is there for them to call whenever they need to, um, and that the hotline is there and available to them 24 hours a day. Um, so the crisis intervention call has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, letting the, the end of that call come to a, a closure by wrapping up what has been discussed. Um, it is hard to end a call when someone's under tremendous distress. And so it is important for you to pace yourself on the call um, and know that you have a limited amount of time for the call. So um, this is just an overview. So defining the problem, when defining the problem, you allow for free expression, you also validation, you normalize, you express acceptance, Open-ended questions and statements are always helpful. You convey empathy. You reflect back what you've heard. Active listening, you power phase. You, you allow them to, um, to hear themselves by using their own language. Um, again, ensuring safety, both physical and emotional. Providing support uh, means really being genuine and offering acceptance allowing them to know that um, you're there to, to support, to empower, to educate, but ultimately they are in charge and they are uh, the only ones who know what works best for them. Um, examining and exploring support systems is very important to remind them that there are indeed services and supports, to spend a little bit of time with them asking them who are their supports and what family, friends, community uh, support systems are there out there? Do they have? Um, it is really challenging for a survivor of sexual assault to to speak about. There's so much shame and guilt and uh, ownership of responsibility that sometimes it's hard to identify or to think that they can use the support systems that they've had. So you want to be able to explore that whenever possible um, and, of course, to offer service referrals to your organization as well as to others. And then, once again, to review the action plan, the tools that were offered, the resources that are being used. Um, and to remind them that they're not alone and that they can call as often as they need to. So once again, I want to take a moment here to pause and uh, just check in on how uh, this information is being received and if there are any questions or comments. So I ask you to please unmute your phones, and if you have any questions, feel free, any comments, feel free to speak to them at this time. You can use... Star seven to unmute your line. So the next few slides um, are responses to some of the common reactions that we get uh, through calls or on calls um, and how best to respond. So clearly, very common, the survivor that calls who is just dealing with fear. We know that um, a traumatic experience such as a sexual assault um, renders the person feeling very vulnerable, feeling very uh, hypersensitive to, to danger, to safety, feeling unsafe, untrusting, um, lots of, of experiences of fear. And so when dealing with someone who is written uh, by fear, you want to let them know that the normal, that the feeling is indeed normal. It is normal to have a response of fear when you have been abused, even when logically you know now you're in a safe place 
um, that the danger is over. It is important to for us to remember and so remind them that that's very normal. Very normal to feel fearful, very normal for your body to still be reacting to a sense of fear, to to be jumpy, to be jittery, to anticipate that there is danger, um, and to distrust people that uh, in the past maybe you would have trusted. It is very common to um, have those triggers bring up fears whether it's because someone or something reminds you of a particular incident when you in the past have felt um, perilous or it reminds you of the actual incident or traumatic event of the assault. So you let them know that it is normal. You help them find ways to make their surroundings safer, even if, once again, um, it's cognitively not necessary. Um meaning there is really no danger. Well, it doesn't matter that there is no danger if it makes you feel safer to um, walk with someone or put extra locks on your door or whatever the case may be, then you do that because that's going to make you feel safer. And at the end of the day, it is feeling safer each and every day, a little bit more that begins to heal that very traumatized nervous system, right? Um, so you help them to identify what can they do, exploring the ways that they can avoid what um, what they are identifying as potential dangers and letting them know that um, they can have the police check their home if that's necessary, um, that it's important also for them to let people that they feel safe with know what's happened to them so that they can have a sense that others are there also um, kind of looking out or watching out, uh, letting someone who perhaps, for example, is assaulted in your home or in your building, letting the maintenance people know or letting the front desk people know or letting the neighbors know, things of that nature. Um, we talked about the um, difficult caller that calls in angry or having a lot of anger. Again, um, how we respond to anger is by letting the caller know that anger is normal, that they do have something to be angry about. And actually, anger can be a very positive emotion if it's used to motivate them, to not, uh, to use that anger to assert and to empower themselves to take control over their lives can be very helpful. Uh, Stressing that rape, of course, is never the survivor's fault. Um, very important no matter what. That is our belief, and we communicate that belief. Uh, you will have survivors who are angry at themselves for what they think they should have done or could have done um, or did to create or in some way um, instigate um, the the assault. So allowing them to vent that anger and to understand that that anger is not to be turned inward, as no matter what or who you are, no one has a right to assault you. Um, reminding them that assault, rape, is indeed a crime, um, and again, that no one has a right to assault. Um, and explaining that people's misconceptions uh, do lead to people being insensitive and um it is very challenging to be assaulted, feel disempowered, and have people blame you. And so if you have the tendency of being super sensitive, feeling angry at others who don't understand or who make assumptions that that's normal. Guilt is another very common emotion. Um, and I think that in speaking about anger, um, I have addressed the issues of guilt, but once again, reminding them that uh, poor judgment, if they should be blaming themselves for having had poor judgment, is not a rapeable offense. No one under no circumstances have the right to assault someone. Um, so helping them to understand where the responsibility, um, where the responsibility is, who is responsible, um, and encouraging them to talk about their guilt feelings. Um, 
often survivors feel guilty about their sense of responsibility about being um, assaulted, but they also feel guilty about how they perceive the, their assault is affecting their family and friends. And so um, creating space for them to talk about and understand that the most important thing in the moment is for them to feel safe and for them to uh, have opportunity to come back to a normalization in terms of their emotions, um, in terms of understanding how they're now going to cope in their life and what changes, um, and that it's not, it's not the most appropriate time or even possible for them to take on how they will deal with supporting and assisting their family members. It's a good time to remind survivors that there are services available for family and friends for those secondary survivors where they can get support as well so that the survivor can be focused on addressing his or her own needs. We know that uh, there is a tremendous challenge in not being able to uh, sleep. Sleep gets very distorted, uh, whether it's because uh, they're being woken by bad dreams or nightmares or because they're just so agitated that they cannot fall asleep. The hypervigilance keeps them awake. Um, the fear of falling asleep and what may happen if they're not on guard. Uh, some of the things that you may want to suggest that can be helpful is keeping a little notepad uh, near their bed that they can just write thoughts down, things that may be uh, playing in their head, in their mind, about the assault, about what, what they should have done, about the what if, all of those what ifs. Just dumping them on a sheet of paper can be helpful um, so that they don't have to continue to try to remember. Sometimes it is when we're resting and all is quiet that memories come up, that uh, things that we had not thought about, visions or, or um, emotions come up. So it's a good thing to be able to jot those down. Um, very important for people who are having a hard time sleeping or having nightmares is to remember that our bad dreams are experiences in our unconscious that we're not able to face during our conscious time or waking time. So that it is really important when they are awake throughout the day to find people to talk to um, about the, the experience, the time to encourage them to call that hotline, to call you. Um, returning to uh, before the assault, when things were okay, thinking about uh, what it was like before the assault, before the rape, um, talking about those times, and um, if possible, even even bringing up those thoughts themselves right before bedtime, um, trying to resource themselves. What are some things that are calming, whether it's music or keeping a light on or, I don't know, a fountain or scents that they can use on their body, um, whatever it may be that they can bring to their sleeping times, creating a ritual uh, that they can depend on, um, maybe doing some breathing exercises. So helping them explore what is routine for them uh, or what are some things that, that not routine, but what are some things that they can add to a routine. Um, also talking about those fantasies and those fears. Once again, particularly if they're woken in the middle of the night, um, and call the hotline, you want to encourage them to talk about what woke them up, reminding them about what's now. Um, it is very helpful if one is woken out of a bad dream or nightmare to be reminded about where you are in the moment, uh, literally to remind them to look around the space that they're in so that even though we know they know that they're in their bedroom or wherever it may be, 
um, that they can focus their mind on the specifics, the details of the space can be really helpful. Um, and again, the breathing to calm themselves down. Um, and spending some time brainstorming with them about other ideas and things that they can do can be helpful. Um, you'll have folks who are calling because holding traumatic events, holding it together, having to move through their day-to-day -day life. For some people, having been assaulted does not mean you get to now be home and rest and heal. They must continue to take care of their family, their household, their jobs. And so you'll find people talking a lot about being really tired. Um, interesting enough, sometimes being tired, being exhausted can lead to then having difficulties falling asleep, the exhaustion um, makes it difficult to fall asleep. So finding out uh, what is causing the exhaustion. Is there a sense of depression? Is it because of lack of sleep? Um, is it because of their diet? Or like what is specifically going on um, other than the emotional distress that may be leading to being tired, feeling exhausted. Is it is it a way of escaping? Um, sometimes the tiredness, the, the the oversleeping can be a sign that they are avoiding, cannot feel, do not do not want to feel the the distress and the uncomfortability. Um, so often being tired, uh, one of the things that's real important is to remember that even if we are not asleep, if you're laying down, resting your body, you're getting rest, right? So uh, sometimes it can be really challenging for survivors who can't sleep to just lay down and rest. The tendency is to want to get up and do things. So it is, it is important to encourage them to just let their body rest. The mind may still be racing and may not be able to fall asleep, uh, but the body can rest by just literally laying down. Folks who are indeed dealing with uh, depression, uh, you want to be able to talk to them about anger, sadness, shame, guilt. Uh, seems these are some of the most common uh, expressions of depression, most often an anger that's been turned inward, an anger towards themselves for what they did or didn't do, uh, an anger uh, towards the world. Um, this is a good time to make sure that you're assessing for whether or not the person is safe from themselves. Uh, so assessing for suicide, listening for that, um, remembering to do your SAL uh, or do a suicide assessment of the acuteness and the lethality of their thoughts and desires to just not be around anymore. You want to make sure that you're asking them how they're dealing with being sad, how well they're functioning um, or not, um, and to make sure that they're being encouraged to really do a lot of talking about what, uh, what the distress is. Again, being sad, being depressed, is a normal state after having been assaulted, after having been raped. Um, and or um, I want to plug in now that a lot of hotline callers are survivors of childhood sexual abuse who may still be dealing with the aftermath or may be having memories. Um, and so it can be very depressing. It can be very hard. It can be very sad. And so you want to let them know it's normal. Yet, the only thing that helps is to begin to talk. Good time to uh, put a plug in for counseling, uh, for face-to-face -face support, um, for support groups. There is nothing that helps more than knowing that you're not alone, that others have experienced what you're experiencing, and that others have uh, been able to recover their sense of self and joy um, even after being assaulted. Um, so, once again, you want to encourage that they speak, that they reach out, that they surround themselves with others who can relate um, and who they can offer support to and also get support from. Um, the survivor who 
is dealing with reactions of um, what I call activation or overexcited, a lot of tension, nervous energy. Um, it is helpful to, on the call, to really ask them to calm down, just to take their time, to speak calmly, slowly, um, not so much for the benefit of you listening, but for the benefit of them feeling more in control of the experience in the moment. Um, asking them to share with you what has helped them, what helps them to calm down, what helps them to feel more grounded. Again, um, survivors who are dealing with a lot of excitement, tension, nervous energy, doing grounding exercises with them or encouraging them to be very aware of where they are, to look around the room and focus their eyes, to feel the place where they're seated, to feel their feet on the ground or on the earth. Those are things that can help one to feel grounded, um, as well as to begin to have dialogue about why why they feel uh, the tension or the nervousness. You may find that they are having some sense of fear that's coming up or some anticipating some event that they uh, think may be triggering for them. Um, so you also want to explore with them what are some ways that they have uh, responded to stress and anxiety in the past. Um, let us not forget that a survivor of sexual violence has experienced challenging situations in their life before, right? This is not the first time they've experienced a challenging situation. This may be the most challenging, but not the only. So how have they coped in the past? Um, it is very likely that in the moment of a crisis, a traumatic event, or when you're feeling re traumatized, it's hard to remember the things that you know and the things that are helpful. So engaging in conversation about have you tried the things that you know can be helpful and encouraging them to try those again. Uh, the issues of dealing with shame um, and um, guilt and shame um, about what others may think about them. Um, are common uh, um, things that are on a survivor's mind. And again, you want to get them to talk about it. You want to suggest that they write about those experiences. You want to educate them about the fact that, unfortunately, there are a lot of misconceptions around the issues of sexual violence. And so, consequently, um, it is challenging to censor ourselves from all of those misconceptions and judgments and uh, things that we will hear or read or comments that people will make. Um, so talking about, uh, about that, talking about how it is important for them to censor what they, what they expose themselves to um, may be the most helpful thing to do. Um, so perhaps they want to not watch certain uh, television programs or news or engage with certain types of people, coworkers, or whatever it may be, um, understanding that it is not, uh, it may feel like um, it is hard to not take it personal. That, that's what I'm wanting to say. Um, it is hard to not uh, take personal when you hear people speaking about uh, sexual assault um, when you have been assaulted yourself. Uh, so you want to be able to really um, educate them, empower them, so that if they choose to engage in discussions where they feel shamed or ashamed and worried about what other people may think, that they feel more um, able to to uh, to protect themselves, to have conversations and maybe even to take on educating other people um, about sexual assault, always reminding the survivor that their story is there to share and to reveal as they wish. Um, and that sometimes their way of um, empowering themselves and taking on an active role may be uh, generalizing and speaking on behalf of survivors of sexual violence in general as opposed to 
uh, their individual experience. Survivors who are dealing with issues of denial and anger of losing control, losing their freedom, um, you know, are also, the, the denial and, and, and losing freedom is another very common um, response of survivors. And I want to state that one of the things that we want to remember is loss in general, that survivors of sexual violence, both childhood sexual abuse survivors as well as adults, are dealing with grief and loss. There's a loss of safety, there's a loss of dreams, there's a loss of hope, there's a loss of, uh, for some innocence, there's a loss of trust, there's a tremendous amount of loss. So important for us to remember that even though we may not be dealing with someone who has literally experienced the death, we are dealing with someone who um, emotionally, psychologically is dealing with several layers of death. Sometimes the death of losing their jobs, uh, their homes, because they've had to leave those places in order to be safe. And so the loss of freedom um, one of the things that you want to do, of course, is to, to join in on uh, the reality is that it is not there, that what has happened is not their fault, it is not there, and it is challenging, um, and that it is a challenge that perhaps even though we know that horrible things happen every day in our lives until it happens to us, we live in a sense of denial of that of that um, danger because it's the only way to get through a day sometimes. But once that sense of safety has been ruptured, one no longer has that option, and that is a loss, and that is very unfortunate. And so making room for, for those uh, discussions. And again, as I said earlier regarding uh, the angry feelings, what are some constructive ways in which that anger can now be used and helping them to to brainstorm about those ideas. There may be a time when they want to give back to the community that has supported them by getting involved in working with survivors and or uh, doing more about speaking on behalf of sexual violence in their small community groups um, or doing some prevention work, or being more active about speaking to their own family members or children. And that is something that will come with time. Um, supporting the survivors who are insecure and, again, who are dealing with just generalized fear um, and feeling out of control, reminding them that feelings are not facts, reminding them about the here and now, that in this moment, whatever moment they're in, they can assess whether or not they are endangered and they can seek to be safer, um, but that it is normal to, to feel and sense danger even if there isn't. So to focus on the feelings um, is important and to address them, but to separate those from the facts, to let them know that they are in control and that they can decide at this moment what they want to do. You want to make sure that they know that whatever decision they make is appropriate for whatever they need to feel in control. Uh, so there's never, am I being too paranoid? Well, if well, that's what you need to do to feel safer in this moment, then by all means, we want to support and encourage that. Um, and of course, you know, I use the word paranoid as a general expression of being oversensitive, not necessarily as the paranoid in, in, in a mental illness state. We listen for that too and uh, make appropriate uh, suggestions and referrals when necessary. But in this case, whatever they need to feel safe, assuring them that, uh, that you're there to help them, that you, the hotline, the systems that are there to support are there to support. Um, you may want to ask um, also if there's other times when maybe they feel safer to speak. Um, and once again, um, if we set the pace, the tone, if we're speaking slowly, if we're grounded, if we're feeling uh, safe, then chances 
are, they will feel safer as well. Um, folks who are worried about their loved ones, we talked about the secondary survivors. But finding out, um, is it safe for them to talk to families and friends about the assault? If they're worried that their loved ones may also be endangered, uh, depending on who the assailant is, that, that can be very uh, real. Um, explaining that if they are confused about what happened, that that's important to know that that's part of the traumatic um, impact, um, that it is important for them to know that it's okay for them not to always understand their actions or their reactions to them and to say their feelings, um, that others may not be able to really understand that. Um, and that it's not their responsibility, that is the survivor, to educate and to explain and to be in that role. Um, to share is one thing. To feel responsible for getting others to understand is not always that helpful. Um, so I'm wondering, we've got um, about five, or five minutes or so, I'm wondering at this time, um, what questions and or concerns or comments um, you callers may have. If you'd like to uh, unmute your phone and share anything with me, this would be a good time as we are beginning to wrap up. You can hit star seven to unmute your line. Santa, this is Freeman from Spokane, Washington. Hi, Freeman. Um, can you explain a little more? Um, I think the second to the last bullet on this on this page, what it means and how to put fear in proper perspective. How to put what in the proper fear in the proper perspective? You said. Right. Yeah. Thank you for, for that question. So how to put fear in proper perspective. I think that it's about really focusing on the here and now um, and helping the person to explore what is happening right now in their environment, in their surroundings, um, that, that may or may not bring up some generalized ideas about how the world is now in danger and open up conversation about so how do you how do you protect yourself in ways that uh, maybe before you were not thinking about there's no way of protecting yourself from an assault so the fear is real and now you walk the streets knowing that um anything could happen at any time so you're more alert you take more precautions uh, do you notice what's happening? Your body. Thank you for Hello? Beyond Survival. My name is Arthur. How many directors are Hello? Sanda? Sanda? I'm sorry, who are you asking for? I was asking for a presenter. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't... Who is this? This is Vivian. I've been listening to the... Oh, yes. It looks like our chairperson I, just got disconnected. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I'm going to ask her to please call back. Is everybody hearing me? This is Freeman again. I hear you. Okay, I'm not sure what happened, but her call got disconnected. So I'm going to ask her to call back in real quick. Sorry about that, everybody.
apologize for the technical difficulties. Looks like she's going to try and call back in in just a moment. We'll be right, right back. People can stick around for about five minutes, let her finish her thing. If not, then I understand you may have to go. Hello? Hello? Yes, I'm so sorry. This is okay. Santa Molina Marshall and got disconnected. Um, yes, you're so in the again, of I was just. I was responding to that question of safety and assessing for the reality of safety, and that is that we do live in a dangerous world. Um, and so that is, that is unfortunate, yet what can we do to feel more empowered? And uh, listening, I was getting ready to say, listening for in our bodies, when we feel unsafe, it is an indicator. When our intuition says we feel unsafe, it's an indicator. Not that case. It's not necessarily um, a fact that we are unsafe. Um, and so it's an opportunity for us to assess, to look at our surroundings, to ground ourselves, and to seek safety. I don't know if that answers your question, but that, that would be the assessment. Hello? I hear you. It's Amy. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I said You're that welcome. I, I let people know while you were gone that if some people had to leave, um, then we understood, but to stick around for just a couple minutes so we could wrap up. Absolutely. Okay. So, and I will also take other questions if, if there are folks on the line that want to ask and or comment on anything. Yeah, we can take about three minutes and then we have to wrap up. Okay. Great. Okay, it looks like we don't have any other questions. Well, it was a pleasure sharing this time with you all, and I thank you for your work and your dedication. Um, the last slide has my contact information. If offline you wish to make contact with me and um, have any further discussion, I'd be glad to, um, to support you at that. Take good care and have a good weekend, everyone. And thank you, Amy, and thank you to the coalition. Thank you very much. As a reminder to everybody, we will be sending out an eval. And then if you have um, joined this webinar through the name of another coworker and there's more than one of you on the line, please email Amy at WixApp so that you get your credit. And um, this will be available online within a week. Thank you very much.